A biblical perspective on life, culture and current events. This is 2020 on Vision. Hey, some good conversation on the way and it'll be especially valuable, of course, for listeners in the Northern Territory, but... We've got this wonderful opportunity to have real insight into what's going on in the Northern Territory. If it doesn't rate as highly in your news headline feed, you might be very interested in the sorts of things we'll be talking about over the next couple of hours. A special edition today of 2020 as we preview the Northern Territory election. Voters will be off to the polls tomorrow. They'll be voting to elect the 25 members of the Legislative Assembly and the next Northern Territory Government. Crime prevention is a key issue for many voters and the only in the Territory ability to keep crocodiles as pets is shaping as one of the major disputes. Well, there are major issues and some marked differences between the competing parties. The current Chief Minister is Eva Lawler, while the country Liberal Party leader is Leah Finocchiaro. We are bringing together a 2020 panel today to make sense of the issues in the Northern Territory and to help discern which parties and candidates are more closely aligned to your Christian values. This hour, we'll be welcoming Nicholas Lay. Nicholas is the Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby. He's based in Alice Springs and the Bishop of the Catholic Church in Darwin, Bishop Charles Gauchy, is joining us. Later this hour, we're also going to hear from Pastor Stephen Lewin from Alice Springs on the Australian Christian Values Checklist. An hour from now, we'll welcome National Director of Politics for the ACL, Wendy Francis, and Pastor Ben Matson is joining us from the Barefoot Ministries in Alice Springs. There's going to be some great conversation coming over the hours ahead. I'm glad to have you along with us on this special edition of 2020 as we talk about the Northern Territory election. Let me welcome our first two guests. Nicholas Lay is the Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby based in Alice Springs and also Bishop Charles Gauchy, the Catholic Bishop of Darwin. Uh, To Nicholas, a welcome along to you. G'day. Thanks for having us, Neil. And to Bishop Charles Gauchy, special welcome to you as well. Thank you so much. Good to be with you. Let me start with Nicholas. Um, We've been talking about the Northern Territory election. Uh, We've had some insights from you earlier. Um, Alice Springs, this is your hometown. Uh, What we're hearing in media all around Australia, the violence, the curfews, race issues. I wonder if you've got a, a little update on how people in Alice Springs are feeling with all of those things that have been going on and the fact that there is an election happening tomorrow. Yeah, it's certainly an election focus across the boards. You know, uh, when we look around all major parties, it's it's their number one talking point, uh, Labor, Country Liberal Party and the Greens and obviously the Independents as well. So everyone knows it's forefront and it's forefront um, for Territorians, of course, it's forefront for Christians. You know, we recently had our election forums and, and lots of these questions came up. Everyone wants to know what the parties will be doing to address this. And so there's no longer an ass, um, assumption of whether or not there is crime and if it is affecting um, our communities and particularly our springs. Uh, it's how how we go about managing it, how we um, bring our solutions. And so, you know, the, the parties have put forward their solutions. And so now it's up to Territorians to, to choose who they want to lead us through this this period of of crime. Bishop Charles, when you've been making sense of the headlines and uh, you've got your own congregation there in Darwin, uh, no doubt you're responsible for people right across the territory. What are you feeling about the violence and the curfews, the race issues, and uh, what sort of feedback have you had from your parishioners around what's coming tomorrow with an election? In fact, I was in Alice Springs uh, last week and I just came back on Tuesday night. So I roam the whole territory. I move around many communities, all the communities really as best as I can. And certainly I hear about this and I heard about it in Alice Springs when I was there last week and I see it in my own streets here in Darwin. So there's no question that there is violence. I think 
what we need to do is really put on our reflective minds to react simplistically to these issues is simply simplistic. It's very, very complex. There is crime, there are wrong things being done. I think if we're going to resolve these, these, uh, these uh, challenges, we need to be asking why is this happening? And I think there is a big, big, long reason. There are many reasons for this. And we need to look at supporting families. We need to look at, um, at intergenerational trauma. We need to look at questions of identity. We need to, to really be coming together uh, in a bipartisan or across politics and look at the real issues together with all those involved. Just a few people battling each other and, and arguing with each other as to what is the best way is not going to resolve the issue. I really believe this is a, a certain uh, emergency where it needs bipartisan and more than bipartisan. <laughs> the community coming together and saying, how can we resolve this? No doubt it's a real issue. Charles, what are you hearing from the politicians, those who are candidates in tomorrow's election? Are there any of the parties or are there candidates who are making sense of those multidimensional issues you're describing? Is anyone coming up with something that uh, if there is a change of government or if there's a continuation of government tomorrow, that there's some solution on the horizon? What are you feeling? Yeah, I'll, I'll premise what I'm going to say by saying I am not committed to any one party. And, uh, and my role is to be able to see the good that is there and to challenge what I believe is not the right thing, not healthy for the common good of the community. Yeah? So I'm free to, to say that's good and I'm free to say I don't agree with that. And I don't align myself to any party in my role, especially in my public role, very clearly. I have seen some refreshing things beginning to come out. People are saying locking kids up is not the answer. It needs to be alternative. There needs to be consequences, of course, but there needs to be other ways of dealing with this for uh, education, uh, support to young people. So I'm seeing some shifts happening. And that's really, I'm really glad to hear that. Certainly, everybody's talking about uh, having much more, much better ways of dealing with the law and all their issues. I am seeing shifts instead of saying, lock them up. Ah, people are beginning to think a bit more deeply. That is refreshing. Nicholas, when you are reflecting on these things, uh, hearing what is on the platforms uh, from parties or from candidates, are you hearing this sort of refreshing, the same sort of refreshing that Charles Gauci is hearing? Um, yeah, interesting question. We we can talk about these issues for hours and hours. And, you know, I've spent many years um, thinking and, and speaking about these things. Um, and there's so many different solutions. You know, um, I guess each party has their version of 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 what they're going to do to mitigate these things. Um, and, you know, often they're in contrary to each other. Um, and so everyone has a different solution, whether it's, you know, more funding at communities, more funding in towns, um, sporting housing in towns, sporting housing out in communities. Um, and yeah, obviously uh, the policing and, and all the rest. I guess reflecting upon it, you know, the territory, it's in a, bad, it's, it's in a bit of a bad state at the moment. Um, and we've been heading that way for a while. And we can talk, like I said, for hours about the reasons why. I think there has to be a significant change um, at this election for us to see any noticeable differences to these things. And so, you know, anyone looking at voting, um, you know, obviously we don't support any particular party. Um, but, you know, the question has to be asked, who do you think is going to um, get us through this this period. And, you know, I am sceptical, you know, Labor has been in, in, in power for quite some time now, and um, uh, they do have new leadership, Eva Lawler is the new, new Chief Minister at the start of the year. And so she has had a, a different approach on crime and, and these issues. And so I guess it's up to the voter who they think is going to to change things. But I think there needs to be drastic change. I think going the way we've been going without changing much isn't going to help. I think we're at a point where we really need to turn the ship around.
And I'd just say we would like to hear from Territorians today. Uh, you might have your own thoughts as our guests are sharing their comments. Uh, there is an opportunity for you today. We won't open our talkback lines, but you can send a text. You can text us a comment. Uh, you might know that Vision has a text line, 0447 0447-488-316. And if you have the Vision app on your mobile device, just tap text in to send us your feedback. You can do that. But that number is 0447 We'll come back to some serious stuff in just a little while. And maybe this is serious stuff I'm about to move us into. But one of the disputes that seems to have been uh, erupting in the Northern Territory, uh, the ability to keep crocodiles as pets. Uh, shaping as one of the issues for the Northern Territory, um, the Labor Party and the country Liberal Party. Let me come to you, Bishop Gachi. Uh, is this a big issue or is this something that, uh, you know, the NT News <laughs> has just got a great headline here and they know that everyone will be interested in if there's a crocodile in the headline? <laughs> I, I think I think you've hit the nail on the head there. Everybody's interested if <laughs> there is crocodiles on the headlines. I certainly am not hearing it as a topic in the streets or in my congregations. <laughs> but I suppose it is of some consequence to some people. I prefer to keep dogs, frankly. I have two dogs and I find them much easier to keep than crocodiles. <laughs> per se, I don't see a major issue. If people have the right precautions, right safety issues and right... Uh, conditions to keep these uh, reptiles well i don't think it's a i don't think it's a moral if you put it that way i think it's a matter of practicalities so i, I reserve my judgment on that one uh, i don't see it as a major issue to be honest but it is for some people so i hope they find a way of keeping people happy on this uh, issue. i guess if you keep crocodiles and dogs ultimately you probably just keep crocodiles you would <laughs> <laughs> Unless you've got some very, very strong fences. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Hey, there might be a listener or two who might wants to make a comment about that and uh, management plans and those sorts of things, which are being discussed uh, at higher levels. Uh, enclosures for crocodiles and uh, what happens if you already have a crocodile or uh, does the rules change uh, as you might be thinking about having a pet crocodile. Hey, let's talk some of the other big, big issues. And there are a lot of things we could talk about economically. But I'd love to talk about some of the issues where our Christian faith comes into con conflict with the way uh, the state tends to move. Uh, come to you, Nicholas Lay, because you have surveyed extensively the parties and candidates about what they believe on a whole host of issues. I wonder if I can uh, just throw to you about what you see as uh, those issues that are shaping as most important in your survey results. Yeah, Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, so in prepa uh, preparation for the election, we have been surveying um, the candidates and also we have regular conversations um, with candidates and, and people who are elected, uh, educating them on, on the various issues. And, um, and one thing that nationally we've been pushing for is uh, the legal um, um, protection for a baby that is uh, born alive following a failed um, termination. And so this is a very specific topic. Uh, this is not a question that is about all abortion. It's a very specific protection. So if um, there was a termination, a baby was born alive, is now um, in heartbeat and happening they're often crying and so uh we, we we're seeking to um, get a legal protection for these babies and so in that survey um we've we've asked around and we've got some some great positive responses so uh the country liberal party have supported that and as well as uh, the independent member for Araluan and mark turner but he, he gave a longer response, uh, which you can check on our ntvotes.org.au website. In principle, he's... So that was great, a great... We would love to see legislation for babies in the Northern Territory. And a lot of people, you know, I've seen in the media recently, medical experts are, are slamming those sorts of things. But it does happen. We know it happens. We've got... Um, 
information around the country that it does happen. And I think every life is precious. And regardless if it's a small percentage of occurrences, those lives um, um, deserve to be protected and to be given appropriate medical care, to be given, um, you know, pain relief, palliative care if they need and and the right to life. And so that was a, a wonderful commitment. And look, it's not a, uh, I would say, a politically advantageous thing to support publicly. And, um, and I know these candidates have um, copped a bit from different candidates and, and the media because of it. And so, um, yeah, I just I thank those candidates for doing that, and I hope that the people can see through the noise of the media, and will um, uh, that those candidates will be supported for being bold on those issues. So that's one issue I can talk about more if you like. Uh, let's stay just, with uh, uh, stay with one at a time, and I'll come back yep. to you and uh, some of those key issues. Those are the things we'll want to talk about. But I'll come to Bishop Gauchi here because uh, the latest research that I was uh, seeing just the other day is that as many as one in two of these late-term abortions are uh, resulting in a child being born alive (laughs) and children being left to die. Uh, It's heart-wrenching. It's something that Protestants and Catholics share very much the foundation of a biblical understanding of being made in the image of God, and these children, these babies, have real value. And yet uh, we're seeing this, and some will describe it as like an atrocity. I wonder if you've got any thoughts here about whether church leaders and the sorts of things that you might say about pro-life issues are being heard in the corridors of power or are they being ignored? Uh, Any thoughts here? Well, I've made a number of statements which are on our diocesan web, which people can read for themselves about the whole area of the value of life, including abortion. So we have got some very clear understandings of that whole area. With these late terms in particular, it is my understanding that if you caused a car accident, you're responsible for a car accident, deemed responsible, and uh, and a woman in late term, in, uh, term had a miscarriage uh, of a baby and it died as a consequence of that accident, you might be up for manslaughter. So there is a, a, an anomaly here where on one level, the law accepts that the child is alive and is a human person. On the other hand, they are left to die. So we certainly as Christians cannot possibly accept that. I don't think it's just for Christians, though. I think it's a big human issue. And any thinking person must stop and pause and say, what are we doing? Where have we come to where this child could live and we are letting them die? We are going back to the exposure of babies that was done in the past in many primitive societies that were forced to do this by circumstance, or at least thought they were forced to do that. So certainly it's a backward step. And um, it is refreshing to hear that some of the politicians are saying, we don't accept that and we will do something about it. That's good news to me. Uh, When we talk about where parties stand on this, uh, Nicholas, um, uh, some things uh, that have come to light. Uh, there's some thought that the country Liberal Party has committed to helping babies born alive in these circumstances where there's late-term abortion. Uh, is that the case? Is that something that has firmed as their policy or was it just a bit of talk? Yeah, so the questionnaire, like I said, it was very specific. I asked this question, do you support legislation that would give human rights to a baby born alive during a failed abortion and that the baby has the right to appropriate medical care as does any other person? And their response to that has been yes. And then since, um, I guess, the media storm against them, uh, they have uh, reconfirmed that. I did see some comments about... um, potentially changing because it's under the clinical guidelines. And we see this in, I believe it's South Australia and New South Wales, where the clinical guidelines protect these babies. Um, and But more broadly across the country, we don't have an overall protection um, in law. And, um, and so if a clinical guideline was protecting a baby, that would be a great thing. Um, um, the legislation is obviously more firm and um, will endure through those clinical guidelines as they change. And so I'd be very keen for a legislative um, bill um, 
uh, with that issue in particular. Um, but also, if a clinical guideline changed, that would be fantastic as well. And um, I think they they have stood firm to it in the media. They haven't they haven't backtracked. And um, yeah, like I said, they've caught a lot of flack for it. Um, um, and so I think if they were going to turn back on that, they would have done it by now. And if there's a change of government, that clearly is a good uh, possibility. And I guess if there's not a change of government, uh, Charles Gauci, uh, the battle continues to uh, try and bring uh, these life issues to the fore. Uh, any thoughts here from you before we move on? I just don't care, really. It is, it is a very real issue. And whoever wins, I think we need to be pursuing this matter. Some have said they will do something about it. The others haven't. It's interesting. It'd be good to hear from them where they stand on this issue. But it's a very real issue and a big moral issue, in my opinion. Well, continuing our conversation in just a few moments, taking a short break, our two special guests, Nicholas Lay, the Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby, he's based in Alice Springs, and Bishop Charles Gauci, the Catholic Bishop of Darwin. Uh, we're going to hear very shortly from uh, the representative for the Australian Christian Values Checklist. Uh, these are uh, resources that you can use as a Christian believer. Uh, you can find that uh, Christian Values Checklist. Uh, simply just Google it, you'll find it. But also on the ntvotes.org.au, you'll have access to the quite extensive research that's been done by the Australian Christian Lobby on what the candidates and what the parties believe about the election that's happening tomorrow. And uh, one of my friends uh, often says uh, people put more research into the new refrigerator they're buying than they do about the parties they're voting for. So <laughs> why don't you turn over a new leaf? And uh, especially if you're listening to us in the Northern Territory today, do a little research about the person you're likely to vote for tomorrow and find out whether their values closely align with yours. Uh, we're going to come back and continue our conversation in just a few moments. Nicholas Lay, our guest, Bishop Charles Gauchi, our guest, back with more in a moment. You are a special broadcast today. We are on the eve of a Northern Territory election. And uh, two guests who've been with us, Nicholas Lay, the Northern Territory Australian Christian Lobby Chief, as well as Bishop Charles Gauchi. He's the Catholic Bishop of Darwin. Uh, through this next little segment too, I also want to welcome Pastor Stephen Lewin, who's based in Alice Springs, and uh, he's representing the Australian Christian Values Checklist. Uh, let me just bring Stephen in here for a moment, and we'll come back to some issues with uh, our other guests. Hey, Stephen, welcome along. Welcome, Neil, and welcome, uh, Bishop. Gauchi and uh, Nicholas there. Very good to see you. Stephen, let me just uh, talk about your Australian Christian Values Checklist for a moment. Uh, there are some researchers uh, in various states and territories around Australia who have been looking very carefully at the Northern Territory and where the parties stand. I wonder if you've got an overview because there's something like 17 questions, 17 issues on your checklist. Uh, there's a representation of either ticks or crosses or some questions question marks over where parties stand. It's more about parties, but uh, what are you seeing as the biggest issues based on that checklist? Pro-life issues, family issues and children issues, especially at school and, of course, crime, youth crime. All right. And uh, the other one, euthanasia. Sorry. Okay, euthanasia is on the list as well. And just for listeners, because when they hear you say uh, all of these different issues, uh, you've got those issues listed on your Australian Christian Values checklist, uh, ticks and crosses. Um, what are you seeing uh, by way of ticks versus crosses so far as where the parties stand on a lot of these important values issues? Well, across is almost every issue. Across is um, there for the Territory Labor Party and the Greens, and CLP come up better by a fair way. And it's interesting, I've got it in front of me, and uh, so describing this for listeners, uh, if you were thinking of voting for the Greens, uh, every box except one is with a cross in it, uh, there's one tick, and that is around environment, support policies to give greater care and love for God's environment. Uh, so there's uh, there's crosses galore in the Greens column. 
there are a few ticks in the territory labour column and a number of question marks. Uh, But in the country Liberal Party, there are a lot more ticks, uh, but there are a lot more question marks. Does this mean that there's a little bit of uh, secretive, we're holding our cards close to our chest type of uh, arrangement coming from the the country Liberal Party, do you think, Stephen? Definitely. I think because there are different views even within the country Liberal Party, and it depends on the actual makeup of the Cabinet how things will go when it comes down to formalising policy on some of these. That's why we put a question mark there. Nicholas, let me come back to you because you've extensively surveyed the candidates and the parties. And uh, there is one trick uh, that some parties like to use. We just won't respond at all. Uh, We won't tell you what we're thinking. And uh, this has become something that's fairly common in recent elections. And I know this is something that the ACL has had to deal with. Um, What do you make of those parties that won't respond and they won't tell you where they stand on these very significant moral and ethical issues i think the strategy for that is um you know in responding directly to a christian organization um such as the australian christian lobby or such um that we will be feeding that information directly to christians and informing them about these things and so if they were to say you know we are heavily pro-abortion and again and you know would support that all the way, uh, if no if, buts or maybes, then they're obviously not going to fill that out for us um, because it's going to give them a negative score. But I noticed, you know, and I sent, you know, our questionnaire to as as many candidates as I could. There was a couple of late additions that um, unfortunately didn't get to uh, because they sort of just threw their hat in the ring at the last second. Um, but for most of them, they were announced quite early. And so I've, I've reached out for to them. And, you know, an example um, would be uh, um, a Belinda who's running in, in Goida. And, um, you know, she re- didn't respond. And, you know, that's fine. She doesn't, um, you know, not required to. Uh, but then from our responses, points to our responses of other candidates and really um, makes a a fuss about it saying, oh, look at this person. He supports um, uh, a baby's born alive um, bill and and then affirms their position that they would be in opposition to that. But they're unwilling to fill out our survey because – you know, in in doing that, I guess they get the the media storm. They might get some support from it, some vo- votes from it, but you know, not a, directly addressing it um, to people that are concerned about these things. Um, and I, I think it's a, just a bit of a strategy, um, to be honest. There's a political strategy in withholding information about your party policy to surveys like that of the Australian Christian Lobby and no doubt uh, the Australian Christian Values Checklist, although I know that the Christian Values Checklist uh, is more across a whole lot of different things, including what sort of media reports there are too. Let me come to Bishop Gauchi here because, uh, Charles, you are so well-connected. Uh, the leaders of churches well-connected in Darwin. Is there a concern amongst church leaders that somehow or other uh, these sorts of things don't get through to ordinary congregation members? Uh, is is it the, the leaders that we would say a little more responsibility required to actually make sure these things are out there? Uh, because sometimes we don't talk politics, but we always like to talk values. Any thoughts here around the leaders and what the congregations believe about the policies of the parties? Certainly in my own in my own church, I have written extensively on our Catholic Diocese of Darwin web. I w- I've sent stuff out to congregations to be read out and given out to people. I have written to politicians about issues. Um, I have asked people in our pews to talk to other people about values. Um, I know that there is not unanimity or f- uh, complete agreement among all Christians about some of these values. Sadly, in my opinion, Um, although I would say there is a consensus about most, there are some who probably have their own views on these issues. But I do believe we have a big responsibility to inform our people, 
first of all, of what are true Christian values on many issues of morality. I think people get confused. They get their values from the media instead of sound Christian understanding of what these values are about. And then how we communicate what we believe in a manner that can be understood to the larger community. So education, education, education and formation to me are so central on this. And we have a moral responsibility to educate, to form and to help our people make intelligent and informed decisions. Okay, let's come back to another issue. And Stephen mentioned this one, uh, concerns of parents in schools. Uh, Let's talk about uh, changes to the Anti-Discrimination Act uh, back in 2022, uh, which was some saw as a direct attack on faith-based schools and freedom of thought. Um, I wonder if I come to you first, Nicholas, uh, so far as what your research might have shown about uh, the attitudes to uh, the uh, the religious freedoms, this Anti-Discrimination Act, uh, and particularly around schools. Thoughts here? Yeah, and I was sort of reflecting on this recently because I've, you know, sort of been out with the election, talking to various people, you know, all sides of politics, and um, I really can't find, you know, a single person that supported these changes, you know, when when I really lay it out that, um, mm. you know, they removed this exemption for faith-based schools um, to hire faith teachers, it just it just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't seem to to benefit anyone. Um, it's a it's a very straightforward protection that we've had for many years, and um, and it's only recently, it, you know, the the it was voted on in in 2022, but it's only been enacted recently, and so people's experience of faith based schools up until now have been um, under this protection that schools have been protected. Um, from discriminating um, and and picking their own teachers. So, um, if you've if you've been to a Christian school or a faith based school um, in you know recent memory, um, it would have been under this protection. And and I don't think people are experiencing discrimination or have an issue with this protection. I think potentially it was a a an um, activist thing that they, they wanted to remove this exemption. Um, but in reality, it just doesn't make sense. And, and as well as the, the second thing that happened in that was the uh, fence-based laws. Um, and so now, you know, it could be found to be illegal. Um, you could be found guilty under the Anti-Discrimination Act if you and someone in a public place um, uh, under a protected attribute. Um, and so that's that's difficult for churches, for Christians. We know that the gospel is offensive. You know, it points to, to me, to everyone, and says we're sinners. We've fallen short of the grace of God. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. And and that is that is the gospel message, but but some some do take offense to it. Obviously, we do that in love and in truth and in grace. Um, but you know, as as churches now, as Christians, um, this this uh, offence based laws uh, could potentially get us in a bit of trouble. Bishop Charles Gauci, let me ask you: You've been quite strident in some of your writings around faith based schools, and uh, I mean, I think uh, uh, some have said uh, they've been impressed by there's a little bit of uh, you know there's some teeth. Uh, that have uh, been expressed there, right? You know, getting a little bit, uh, um, a little more robust in the conversation around faith-based schools. And of course, when we talk about schools, we're talking independent Christian schools, the Catholic schools. There's uh, lots of those uh, all around Australia and uh, all around the territory. Uh, what have you been saying around faith-based schools? Well, again, I'm in the public forum on these issues, and there are records of this on our diocesan web where I've spoken clearly about this. I remember having a press conference in front of the steps of the cathedral where we had Christians of various denominations together, even some politicians and even some other faith people who are not Christians who joined us, where we spoke very clearly. And the following day, I was in Parliament speaking with the chief minister and the attorney general of the time where they said that they would put in Hansard records about respecting um, the rights of uh, the Christian or faith-based schools to employ uh, leaders and religious education people who are of that faith and um, and uh, also uh, other teachers who would respect the ethos of that school. 
they felt they for, fell short of putting it in the legislation. It is recorded in Hazard. However, it it, is, it leaves itself open to dispute because it is not in the legislation. It is only in Hansard. So it leaves open to expensive and potential uh, um, uh, lit litigation. Uh, and so on. I would love still now to see that recorded properly in the legislation, not just purely in Hansard, because it is ambiguous. And I know one party said they would do something about that. So I still feel strongly that we, while they did give some protection, clearly publicly stated and is in Hansard recorded, it's not quite tight enough, in my opinion, and it leaves room for all types of possible litigation. What's the point of having Christian schools unless we speak about our values? On the other hand, our schools need to be extremely respectful, of course, to all people, while being clear as to what we really believe. There's no ambiguity there. We need to have clarity with respect to others, but clarity. Otherwise, no point having them. We walk carefully and there is a fine line and there is uh, all sorts of values to hold in balance. Uh, let me come back to you, Nicholas Lay, because if we're talking about where the party stands, this is a preview to an election in the Northern Territory tomorrow. Um, what's going to happen uh, so far as where parties stand on these issues around the Anti-Discrimination Act and what that means for Christian schools? Are there any uh, comments or are there any commitments that are coming from either side that you can comment on? Yep, so for the Labor Party, um, they obviously passed the laws and they haven't made any public commitments um, to repeal those laws. Um, Greens have declined to comment on it. I, you know, I sent them a, a check, uh, a questionnaire. Um, they seem like they were going to respond and they haven't, so I haven't, haven't heard any commitments from them. Um, and obviously the country Liberal Party, at the time of these laws passing, they committed to repealing um, those amendments made and have held firm on that ever since. And, um, yeah, that's that's their commitment. So that's the, the three major parties. And then, obviously, there's independents like um, uh, Mark Turner and Robin Lamley. They've also committed to um, supporting a repeal of those um, amendments. So that's uh, the information I have. And the big challenge, of course, is if there is a change of government, uh, holding those leaders to account uh, for the things that they have said leading up to an election. Hey, we're going to take a very short break and be back with our special guests, Nicholas Lay, the Northern Territory Director of the Australian Christian Lobby. We've also got with us Bishop Charles Gauchy, the Catholic Bishop of Darwin, and Pastor Stephen Lewin, who's in Alice Springs, representing the Australian Christian Values Checklist. Northern Territorians, off to the polls tomorrow. It's a Northern Territory election, and an opportunity like this, as we try to do before state and territory elections, uh, to make sure that uh, if you're listening to us today in the Northern Territory, uh, you have somewhere to go to be able to say, what do the parties and the candidates believe? Do their beliefs completely conflict with my Christian values? And uh, it may be a helpful resource to you to know that there are some resources like ntvotes.org.au. It's an election website set up by the Australian Christian Lobby. Or other resources like the Australian Christian Values Checklist, which you can find at christianvalues.org.au. A simple one page, ticks and crosses across a whole lot of issues. Let me come to uh, our guest, uh, Stephen Lewin. Stephen, uh, you mentioned a little earlier that uh, voluntary assisted dying, or what we know as euthanasia, uh, has been on the checklist. I wonder what uh, you've got uh, listed on your Australian. Australian Christian Values Checklist as to where the parties might stand on the issue? Well, that's a good question. Um, Territory, Labor and Greens give it a cross. And Council Liberal Party look like it will be a cross, but there's a question mark there. But we have got an indication from one of the independents, definitely, that they will oppose euthanasia, and that's Robin Lambie, because... She's very much more to see palliative care kept in place and, in fact, improved. In fact, she was the health minister that supported the palliative care unit come to Alice Springs, which we have here. And Indigenous people are very supportive 
of the palliative care unit, but also they're against euthanasia. They want to see their people around as long as possible and uh, have dignity in death. Bishop Gauci, uh, VAD, euthanasia, uh, this is a significant life issue. Uh, what have you been talking about in the lead up to this election so far as getting these uh, Christian values out uh, to your own uh, your own uh, supporter base, your own membership, uh, your own parishioners? And uh, what, what do you think uh, we ought to know about uh, VAD and the Northern Territory and where Christians ought to stand on that? Again, I've written extensively on this and sent information around to my people. Again, these are recorded on our Catholic Diocese of Darwin web. Uh, We have a big, strong commitment to the value of human life from birth till death, that that there is dignity and it needs to be treated as such. Uh, Euthanasia or VAD uh, has a slippery slide to it. And when you look around the various countries, you can see that once you open the gap, it continues to broaden and broaden and broaden. We are strong advocates, of course, of helping people die with dignity properly, with uh, the best relief from pain and uh, and to be supported socially so they are not alone. The families are not alone. We need to do our best to help people die with dignity. I am a strong believer and encourager of very good quality palliative care. I believe if we had very good quality palliative care uh, at home as well as in our institutions, people will often not opt for that. Sadly, that is being seen as a cheap solution by some people and some politicians around Australia. And it's, in my opinion, it is a slippery slope. They're even talking now about that for possibly for mentally ill people instead of dealing with the mental illness properly. We know that people for a while sometimes wish to die. Uh, and they are depressed and they are in a situation where they don't see how they can get out of a black hole. But with care, they are so glad they didn't take their own life when they are better. Now, palliative care will not relieve all pain, but most pain can be now controlled, I am assured by medical experts. There will be some pain that is still there and how we can help deal with people. So this whole area to me is very, very serious. It's opening a Pandora's box and we need to tread very, very carefully. I will conclude by saying by palliative care, put more resources in communities, in the cities, uh, in institutions, Mm -hmm. at home. And to provide, us churches and others, need to provide support to families. If you are the only person supporting a dying parent and you are alone, sometimes you we are tempted to find the easy solution because you just can't cope. If we were supporting families more, uh, the supporters of people who are in palliative care, I think it would minimize a lot of distress. So it's uh, simplistic answers in this area, to me, are for getting some very, very deep basic values. Certainly, we need to educate our people. It's not a Christian option, but I think we need to dialogue with the larger community, not just with Christians, about the uh, dangers of this whole area and how we need to do our best as a whole community to help people in the dying process. Well, there certainly has been changes in various states and territories, a diminishing of palliative care resources and uh, promotion of VAD. Uh, there certainly is an imbalance there. And, uh, of course, coming from our Christian values base, uh, where we are valuable, created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, we want to be able to discern which is the way forward uh, based on a solid biblical values base. Let me come to you, Nicholas. Uh, is there anything in your research uh, that might show where parties are standing on VAD? We know that it's a slippery slope. We know that it's getting worse. More and more people are being exposed uh, to the option for euthanasia. And uh, even in some places around the world, um, teen- Teenagers are who are having a bout of depression, uh, even being offered such things. Uh, these things are dreadful, and slippery slope is certainly uh, a terminology that shows itself uh, so clearly in this instance. Uh, your your thoughts here, Nicholas? Where are the parties standing on euthanasia? So there's been a a very clear commitment from the Labor Party that they would table legislation if if elected in in this election. Um, 
all parties will be given a conscience vote. So both Labor and the country Liberal Party have committed to that. There has been no public commitments from the country Liberal Party about legislation. Um, and yeah, so that's the two, I guess, public um, commitments. Um, but like you said, um, it is a, a slippery slope. And I, I just note on the report, a report was released recently in the Territory um, making recommendations on these things. And um, it talked about on a recommendation um, that you must have a decision-making capacity at all stages. But if you read in the, the fine print, it says the, the panel broadly supports the development of specific criteria in the case of people with impaired decision-making capacity um, and talking about people under guardianship and intellectual disability. So it's already a slippery slope here in the Northern Territory. So I guess as Christians, we need to stand up strongly against this, oppose it publicly. Um, and I, I really think there's going to hopefully be a a, a, a push back from the bush, um, people out bush. I, I know, you know, I was talking to an elder out bush yesterday and I asked him very plainly without sort of giving away my opinions and, and he rejected it completely. So that's great. And they have a, obviously a strong faith um, base out bush. Um, and I guess as the church more broadly, you know, obviously stand against these things as they're coming in. But as the church, we need to be prepared in the case that it does. Equipping Christians, um, knowing that as Christians, we are to reject this. This isn't an option for us. We, we're to give this um, this right to God um, and to leave room for his mercy. And, and so... We need to be prepared in that in that regard as well. Well, we are running out of time and uh, we're about to farewell our guests who've been with us this hour and a uh, little changing of the guard, a couple of new guests. Wendy Francis, the National Director of Politics for the ACL, joining us next hour, as well as Pastor Ben Matson, the Alice Springs Barefoot Ministries pastor. But for the gentleman that we've had on this particular segment, uh, you will have heard Bishop Charles Gauci mention the Catholic Diocese of Darwin website. He's written extensively across a lot of these issues, these values issues. And for listeners, uh, my encouragement is to visit that website and read some of the articles that Bishop Gauci has written. We've also been talking about the ntvotes.org.au website, where you can find the extensive research from the Australian Christian Lobby, not only of the parties, but also the individual candidates and where they stand on these significant issues. Issues. I'd also point you to the Australian Christian Values Checklist. Uh, they've been doing this for many, many, many years now. And if you go to christianvalues.org.au, a one-page representation with ticks and crosses uh, that gives some indication around where the parties will stand uh, with regard to tomorrow's election in the Northern Territory. Uh, it is time to farewell. Uh, let me thank you so much, uh, Nicholas Lay, for joining us. Thank you, Nicholas. Thanks, Neil. Great to be on. Thanks for having us all. Thank you, Bishop Charles. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.